Upon hearing the Armenian language spoken in the diaspora, some may feel warmth and comfort, excitement and surprise, or even anxiety at the thought of responding in Armenian. The Armenian language is a huge part of our identity, and is one that has evolved and shape-shifted to last thousands of years. Where is the language today? What is the reality of Armenian in the diaspora? We are joined with Shushan Karapetyan today in the studio to do a deep dive into our topic of the day, the Armenian language in the 21st century. I'm Krista Marina Apardian. And I'm Haik Minasian. And you're listening to Hi Tuk Talks. The official podcast of the AYF West. A couple of Armenians talking in the world. Shushan Karapetyan holds a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, as well as a graduate certificate in teaching English as a second or foreign language. She has over 10 years of experience teaching Armenian as a foreign and heritage language in many different contexts. She's currently the deputy director at USC's Institute of Armenian Studies. She also hosts the Institute's New Roads podcast, which further explores the Armenian language in depth. Shushan, thank you so much for joining us in the studio today. Thanks for coming, Shushan. We're happy to have you here. Um, I'm a big fan. Um, I am too. Yes. <laughs> but like I was saying, our unique language is a huge factor of our Armenian identity. It's also a huge responsibility we carry as diasporans. We feel that pressure. It's on our shoulders. How do I teach my kids my broken Armenian <laughs> is the title of your infamous dissertation. Uh, for many of us who haven't had the opportunity uh, to read your work, what are the key takeaways for the diaspora from, from your research? Ready? Yeah, some big <laughs> points, you know. We're all ears. We're all I ears. want to jump in like okay. that. God, wow. Yeah. Well, hi. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for having me. Um, infamous, I hope, more. Very <laughs> infamous in my heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope infamous in a positive manner. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Okay, how do I teach my broken army into my kids? Um... Big takeaways. One, Armenian is really important. Right. <laughs> I, I can't. I, Armenian is not just really important, centrally, viscerally, gut level important, whether you know it or not. Mm. For what? Though, our, our identity? For our identity, for our conception of who we are, mm -hmm. for our definition of what it means to be Armenian, not only for ourselves, right. for other Armenians. Right. So that's what I mean. Even if... I myself don't speak Armenian or don't speak Armenian well, the prototype of an Armenian speaks Armenian. Right. Mm. Yeah. Um, so um, I had a couple of questions and the dissertation kind of turned into five, six mini dissertations because not much work had been done on Armenian. So here I was at UCLA that has the nation's first heritage language resource center that looks at immigrant languages and um, they're so excited about new languages. And I come on and I say, I want to study Armenian. And I have nothing to cite, literally nothing wow. to cite. So I went to my Armenian studies advisor and I said, I want to do this. And he said, well, you'll be swimming all by yourself in the ocean. Yeah. And I said, OK. <laughs> Did you expect that going in? Did you expect to kind of start I, from scratch? Um, yes and no. Um, he kind of pumped me up in that, you know, people will be citing you, you know, and I was like, mm -hmm. yeah. I, just, <laughs> I mean, they are now. They it's are. True. I know. That's exciting. So I looked at a couple of things. One, um, scholars will say, well, children of immigrants, they know their home language to some degree. Right. And then they'll qualify it right, to some degree. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that mean to know a language that you grew up with at home, but are not formally educated in or you grew up with at home, you have some education, but the dominant society speaks another language. What does that mean to know Armenian? Right. So one, I looked at it linguistically. What are the gaps? So we use another metaphor like um, the grammatical competence of a heritage speaker is like a piece of Swiss cheese and it has really big holes. So my question was, what are the holes? So I looked at that. That's a linguistic analysis. And if you're interested, we can kind of um, provide examples of that. I looked at language use patterns. When do Armenian American youth use Armenian and when do they use English? But more importantly, what triggers that choice? Because it's not random. 
Right. There are particular triggers. So my goal was, okay, why would you decide at that moment? Like speaking with my grandma. Or, exactly. Right, you know or if you're at an Armenian wedding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or if you're at the UCLA or USC campus in your linguistics class. So it, is it space? Is it physical location? Is it emotional context? Mm. Is it topic? What are you talking about? Are you talking about familial love or romantic love mm-hmm. interesting i mean have you ever noticed we speak more armenian when we're around non-armenians and we want to you know speak <laughs> about them the armenian becomes perfect at that point is it uh, gender based so mm-hmm. for example i noticed that young armenian men even though they may not speak armenian as well as their female counterparts display their armenian publicly to assert their like their peacock flip feathers yeah, right exactly their machonas their armenian mm-hmm. so very interesting thing so so that was one like language use patterns another one was um attitudes and ideologies about armenian what do we feel about armenian what kind of beliefs do we have um it's a little political sometimes right a little or? political absolutely because you know armenian doesn't exist in a kind of a vacuum by itself, especially in the diaspora, Armenian is always competing with another dominant language. And Mm -hmm. especially when it comes to Western Armenian, Mm -hmm. Western Armenian is always in competition. You know, at least Eastern Armenian has a state that is at its back. We feel like we're even competing with Armenian or Eastern Armenian. Right. And that's an interesting, that's an interesting point to address. So I looked at kind of both attitudes on an indiv- individual level, attitudes uh, of the family, and also state nation level. Like in America, what kind of attitudes do we project about bilingualism, about minority languages? And right. how does English, as this now current global lingua franca of business, mm-hmm. of technology, of everything, mm-hmm. oppress minority languages like Armenian? Yeah. So, so that was an interesting um, part. And probably the most surprising element of the dissertation was the anxiety. Um, you know, when you go into a research project, typically you know what kind of results you'll get. Mm-hmm. Um, and then often you don't get them, but at least you anticipate some of it. Right. Um, what I didn't anticipate was the level of anxiety that young Armenian Americans feel when they use Armenian, regardless of how well they know or speak Armenian. You'd think it's, oh, if I don't know it so well, I'm going to feel stressed or tense. It's not the case. Even the most competent youth I interviewed, who to me were, I was blown away with how well they speak Armenian, feel lots of pressure, lots of stress, lots of fear of judgment, fear of not being good enough, fear of not being assessed Armenian enough. Mm -hmm. So this really took me off guard. Um, and ended up being probably, for me, the most important part of my findings. That's interesting. Haig and I both grew up, I mean, we all have experience living in Orange County, where the Armenian community is much smaller. So we relate to that on our on our own levels. But that's very interesting, the fact that even people that are comfortable speaking have this fear of misstepping or, you know, giving a, a different impression. Uh, absolutely. And, and a lot of it came from their experiences with their own family members. Right. So same, th- yeah. This is very interesting because the same family member or teacher or community member who in all earnestness is trying to promote Armenian and to instill good behaviors is unknowingly hindering that process by teasing, Mm -hmm. by correcting. Um, Yeah. No, my uh, grandma's a perfect example of, she's also a translator and a perfectionist at language and within the same sentence she's breaking me up every other word and it would be discouraging I I'd, I'd almost wouldn't want to continue the sentence but where's, sure. where's that line from informative and, and helpful to then discouraging you know I, I appreciate it because I get like the whole background of the, uh, the structure and everything but I I had friends in elementary school who maybe didn't have Armenian speakers at home and were just trying to learn Armenian by themselves and having that constant criticism of their sentences you know they at that point they gave up you know they didn't want to continue I'm happy you brought this up because I've thought about this a lot um you know we've participated I myself my colleagues in like teacher training for example training teachers mm-hmm. who teach at Armenian schools and they're always very taken aback when I say error correction doesn't necessarily work the way you think it does. 
mm -hmm. even parents, a couple of times I've given lectures and parents have stood up and say, are you, are you telling us we're damaging our kids? We can't have fun. We can't tease. And I think it's important to keep the context in mind. For example, if you're a family in Armenia or in Buchamut mm -hmm. and your child speaks Armenian at home and also goes to an Armenian school and also society functions in Armenian and that child will have every kind of resource to develop their Armenian, then as a teacher, by all means, correct. Right. <laughs> right. You're not damaging their linguistic self-esteem. Right. They will have a chance to figure this out. But when this child is in a diaspora context, where they only get Armenian from very limited resources, where they are functioning in a dominant language and will always have to worry about this, then you have to be a bit more sensitive about what you do, what you correct. For example, correcting their spelling before they can even speak properly or before we've determined that they will actually write. How important is it that they spell correctly? I'd rather they have the courage to write something or say something right. before we get to, you know, the perfect Armenian. Someone who I, I think it was Khachik Muradian who encourages this imperfect speaking. He was saying we shouldn't even be against or he was trying to think of creative ways of how to uh, encourage people. And he was saying even maybe uh, using Latin alphabet just to encourage them to use it more if they're having difficulty with the spelling in Armenian. Well, I brought this example to some of the Armenian teachers as well. Um, so I have a 12-year-old and a 6-year-old. And when I saw the way they were being taught to read in English, for example, um, one of the first things they do before they can spell is, for example, the teacher, the kindergarten teacher, will take them out for a walk in the school and then bring them back in the classroom and tell them to write their experience phonetically. Mm. phonetically because they don't know how to spell their kindergartners some of them don't know all the letters and these kids will phonetically write and there will never be a red mark on it and then they will read and then have this sense of empowerment that before they can actually spell right, right they've, they've done this like formal presentation and and i think i i think one of the most key elements that comes up when we talk about Armenian in the diaspora is a sense of empowerment and ownership. If you don't feel like you own this language, then you won't have the empowerment to play with it, yeah. to create with it, to explore with it. And language is something you should play with and explore. adapt and learn. Absolutely. Grow. 100%. Absolutely. But I think what we're doing in all our earnest efforts, and I want to say that, um, by no means do I mean that anyone intentionally is hindering this process. Actually, it's funny because we're doing so much. Everyone is so invested in maintaining Armenian. But basically, we've invested so much. And, you know, I've talked about this before in, in, in other platforms. We've kind of put it on a pedestal. So Armenian is something we should worship. Mm -hmm. Armenian is something we should preserve. Armenian is something we should... Holy and untouchable. That's and, it. Right. That's it. But if something is holy and untouchable, how can you play with it? Mm. Well, for me, it's a yeah. it's communication. It's a tool at the end of the day. And if it's not doing its job, if people aren't able to use it to communicate, then it's going to be uh, you know, not used and go out of use at that point. Yeah. Um, Shushan, shifting gears a little bit, I'm sure we'll get back to yeah. more of the implications of, of language. But what what made you feel drawn to such a dedicated study of language? Um, coincidence. <laughs> Uh, so, well, yeah, coincidence and I guess not coincidence, destiny maybe. <laughs> um, I always knew I wanted to go to grad school. I studied anthropology as an undergrad. I was a, an undecided major before that, and anthropology made sense because I was bilingual and bicultural, and anthropology says, hey, every culture has their own perspective <laughs> on the world, and I was like, Got that. <laughs> Sign me I up. wish I studied anthropology. Yeah. In <laughs> By the way, I didn't study anthropology to go to law school, which is what I noticed a lot of Armenian youth are doing. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's such a shame to waste anthropology for a law school degree. No, I, I mean, a lot of our friends are political science majors, yeah. every, everything, and then into law school. Into law school but yeah. anthropology would be so useful for our current state. Exactly. So much to study. Exactly. And um, so I had decided I was going to do graduate work in anthropology and then end up in like an Armenian village somewhere, right? Oh. Bringing the Armenian element of it. Mm -hmm. um, until I discovered UCLA has one of the best Armenian studies 
graduate program. So I'm a Bruin too, by the way. So mm-hmm. you should have mentioned that earlier in this conversation. I'm a Bruin, but I was raised by Trojans, so it's a very like you know. We're yeah. Trojans. Well, exactly. I was a lifelong Bruin, and now I'm at USC. There so we live a double life. It's yes. Fine. Mm-hmm. Well, for Armenians, I think that's that's normal, <laughs> that's right? Normal. That's normal. That's part of the package. Um, yeah. So then I, I decided to go to you know, directly the Armenian studies path. And I remember my, you know, you have to write a kind of a research proposal to get into grad school. And mine was, I want to study the diaspora experience, but it wasn't language focused. It was more, how do immigrants adapt? Um, And then um, for those who are planning to go to grad school, no, you'll change your topic a good 8.5 times Mm -hmm. average. So that changed into like 17th, 18th century classical Armenian drama um until, i would love to read that yeah <laughs> uh until i ended up again coincidentally getting a job teaching armenian at glendale community college at age 23 nice um and they said you're going to teach a class called the basic conversation in armenian and then you're going to teach another class called armenian for armenian speakers and I said, wonderful, what curriculum, what textbook should I use? They were like, you're on your own with that one. <laughs> we, we have the course titles, go. Oh my. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask, what is the current state of the curricular? Or at least back then, it, it sounds like there was nothing. Or There was like there. an outline of like topic headings, pretty much. I mean, were they copying from other languages maybe or even the elementary schools are, i mean private schools i mean where are they getting i think their private schools from? is a different matter we okay. can get to that at the college level it's more every instructor on their own okay. um, so i ended up developing a lot of my materials right. but what was interesting was that both the basic conversation class and the heritage class were like 99 percent armenian heritage students okay with uh, a handful of students I call Armenian for romantic purposes or (laughs) Armenian for employment purposes. So these were non-Armenians who were married, engaged, dating, want to be uh, with an Armenian partner. Mm -hmm. Or these were um, firefighters, police officers, city of Glendale employees Mm -hmm. who realized how useful Armenian is for their employment who were studying Armenian. Taking a few classes at Mm -hmm. the UCC. Mm -hmm. Um, So... That kind of personal practical experience with this big gap in Armenian language education really shook me up. Um, And I started seeking professional development opportunities for myself to serve my students better and um, came across an email at UCLA that said, you know, workshop for heritage language teachers. And I had to Google heritage language because that wasn't a term that was common at that time. I went to this workshop and my life changed. I decided, you know, um, this is something I'm passionate about. And this is something, um, this is research with consequence, you know, Mm -hmm. research that will have tangible impact on my kids. Um, Yeah. So I just kind of shifted, shifted gears. And um, what did you learn at this conference that woke, you know, woke in this? Yeah, I learned that there's a big crack, at least in the U.S., if not globally, crack in the educational system that doesn't serve heritage students. So often if you're a child, so a heritage student, again, is a child who grows up in a family that speaks a non-English language to some degree, but then lives in a society where the dominant language is English. In our case, it can be a different language, obviously, in other um, contexts. And heritage students are either placed, let's say, in a college setting, in a foreign language class, where sometimes they speak better, more fluent than the instructor, right? Because they're mm-hmm. native speakers in a sense, yeah. but they can't read or write um, often. So that class doesn't meet their needs or they're like placed in a very high level language arts literature class where you're studying, you know, the Armenian novel in the 18th century. Yeah, literature. And every- right. Yeah. And they don't belong in that class yet. So basically academia hadn't found a way to meet the needs of this very special group of learners. And I saw all of my Armenian students in that group yeah. um, and, and basically the workshop said there are very specific pedagogical methods, teaching methods, instructional methods, how you teach them, what material, material you use. So mater- the materials we use for foreign students. So Joe Bruin, who's studying Armenian, isn't the same that you should be using for an Armenian student. The methods you're using. So, for example, and all of us have taken a French or a Spanish class. Yeah, yeah. Um, you start with zero. You start with the alphabet. You start, you know, smaller blocks and then you slowly build. That's not, and you use a very 
grammatical lens, right? You, it's very explicit grammar instruction. This is your direct object. This is your indirect object. This is your subject. But heritage students don't see their language through a grammar lens. Right. Yeah. That's so true. That's right. why I had difficulty learning French because I was like, yeah. the, oh, when I learned Armenian or English, it just came, you know, we just learned it in the house. Right. Yeah. But right. I even feel like public school kids have a hard time learning those languages anyway. Oh, though. absolutely. So even maybe absolutely. But it's more of instinct versus yes. pointing out, like you said, the, the, the direct object. And, mm -hmm. yes. you know, I could I could translate a sentence, but if you asked me to point out those things, I honestly Break would, it have, down. would have Can't, trouble with that. I cannot. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so something simple, like they actually need authentic materials. So give them a short story, have them watch a, you know, a YouTube interview with someone speaking Armenian. Don't give them grammar exercises because when you give heritage students grammar exercises, they don't look at the grammatical correctness. They look at the content. Right. right? So you give them a sentence and say, what's the question word? And they're answering the question. It's yeah. the <laughs> underlining the question word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, so it's just all of these things. And I just had these light bulbs going off. You know, I was like, we have to do this for Armenian. <laughs> yeah, something has to be done. Yeah. So, oh, no, I'm glad. That yeah. was that coincidence. And I guess, I don't know, destiny too. Yeah. So from the other perspective, from, from the student perspective, when learning um, Armenian, you know, depending on what degree, of course, how important is it to have Armenian speakers at home? Is it a big part of, of language retention? Yes, absolutely. Though not exclusively, of you course. can learn a language. But so first, the easiest way to learn a language is to be exposed to it in your early childhood. Mm -hmm. The kind of easiest, I mean effortless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we as human beings are wired for language. So as a child, whatever you're exposed to, that's what kind of activates your language mechanism in your mind. Um, and if a, a, a newborn is exposed to Armenian by, for example, 12 months, they will have acquired the phonetic system. By 12 months, all of us, all human children, will limit our phonetic system to whatever we're exposed to. So we are capable of every phonetic system out there by the age of one year old, you are you have taken in the phonetic system, that, or whatever. Is that why some to. people can't do or ch? Yes, those, <laughs> yes. Eh, there you go. And that's why um, when we talk about, for example, second language acquisition, they say you know the cutoff line is uh, pu puberty, mm. but only for accent. So you can become a highly proficient speaker of any language, even in adulthood. But if you want that flawless accent. It's impossible. It's almost, impossible. almost impossible. There are always exceptions. In academia, there are always exceptions. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So um, it's very important to have that exposure at an early age um, because the big problem with heritage language students is the problem of domains. So one, a lot of um, Armenian American youth in our case, right, have capacity in Armenian. And that capacity is what? This like conversational, casual. Talk to their family, maybe. Routine. We call it kitchen table talk. Mm -hmm. Right. They're like, shutara, verka, tushatsak, amot, khetara, kotaj, yerki. Yeah. You know. But the second Everyday they have to do. Uses, yeah. yeah. The second they have to go do business, though, or exactly. do technical things. Exactly. I couldn't. Yeah. yeah. But where do you learn the business, the technical, the abstract? From exposure. Right. Language learning is very simple. It's all about input, which means what language are you exposed to, and opportunities for output. Mm -hmm. Do you have opportunities to then use that language in a natural, authentic, welcome environment where no one will kind of look at you weird? Right. I, I learned French in college. I went and studied abroad in France, and I got a lot of weird looks. Discouraged me. <laughs> from right. Continuing. Right. So um, how important is it for a family? Yeah. Um, that's kind of the easiest way to make Armenian natural and welcome and authentic. Mm -hmm. Because imagine if you don't use it in a family setting, then you really will go like the foreign language learner route, right? The classroom mm -hmm. context, which we all know is a simulated, inauthentic context. Well, right. here comes the Armenian school uh, element where it isn't that maybe comfortable setting like it would be your household and that uh, the issues that the kids are having there with speaking and maybe they're getting... Uh, you know, uh, the teachers are interrupting them, getting in, uh, you know. Uh, or different students are at different levels, so that creates right. an, an interesting dynamic well, there, well, too. Well, what I wanted to ask was, how are the Armenian schools and their curricula taking care of this? Are they falling behind? 
Uh, are there some things that they've done recently that are maybe improving on the challenges? Um, that's a really good question. So Armenian schools um, obviously have their challenges and have their amazing rewards and accomplishments. Definitely. Um, I think Armenian schools um, have lagged a bit behind in terms of meeting their students' demographic and kind of sociolinguistic profile. So Armenian schools are Middle Eastern models, yeah, mm -hmm. for the most part that have been kind of imported into the U.S. Mm -hmm. by Armenians from the Middle East, for whom at that time, Armenian wasn't a second language. Armenian was really a primary, primary language. Yeah. And many of those schools in the Middle East, the original models, functioned as Armenian as native language and Armenian as primary language of instruction. I see. And that's not, and that's what they're copying here, but it's not relevant here. Well, it's not the so same. they started with that model. But then the demographic of their students changed. These students went from very proficient Armenian speakers coming from Armenian speaking homes to now coming from mixed homes or from non-Armenian speaking homes. And something else happened. The curriculum changed. It went from Armenian as primary tool, like you said, this is very important, to the whole curriculum being in English. And then having an Armenian part where it was mm -hmm. Armenian for Armenian language, Armenian for religion, Armenian for history. So here is a huge, huge gap in terms of linguistic science. We just said in order for you to learn a language, you need to be exposed to it and you need to be exposed to it in a lot of different contexts. But what's happening with kids at Armenian school is they're being exposed to Armenian only in Armenian class. Mm -hmm. So they're doing Armenian for Armenian grammar, Armenian for religion, which is, again, another Armenian context, and Armenian maybe for Armenian history or culture. But they're not learning math in Armenian. Mm -hmm. They're not solving problems in Armenian. They're not learning geography in Armenian science. or social science. Yeah. So, you know, often I hear parents or teachers complaining, saying, our kids can't do smart things in Armenian. But have they been given the opportunity to do that learn or practice those words that's it yeah could you measure a room in armenian we talk about this right could you solve a long division problem in armenian in your mind think about it in armenian and it's not the student's fault why is it the student's fault if they've never been taught math in armenian but for example the same folks who established armenian schools here in the middle east did do math and science and geography in armenian mm -hmm. so and I, I'm sure you, you probably know about the dual immersion programs here at Glendale Unified School District, at Los Angeles Unified School District, all over the United States. Dual immersion solves this problem by offering content in the target language. So you are doing, you're learning about U.S. history in Armenian. Mm -hmm. You're learning about Einstein in Armenian so that there isn't this division in your mind that Armenian mm -hmm. is only good or useful for things Armenian. Mm -hmm which is, you know, often siloed. And then there's English, the language of the world. Right. <laughs> you mentioned um, doing long division and thinking about it in Armenian. One thing that I, I experienced, and I'm sure a lot of diaspora Armenians have experienced, is I grew up thinking in Armenian, like my thoughts were in Armenian. And then at some point there was a shift. Um, d is that indicative of a shift in what is now your dominant language, the language that you think in? That, yes and no. So um, it's very hard to define dominant language. And I think um, it's not a static state, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's something that changes over time. And, you know, I, I give this example a lot. I was born in Armenia. We moved here when I was 10. So from zero to 10, I was Armenian dominant. And then I was very anxious as a fifth grader to pick up English so I could fit in. Mm -hmm. Within a couple of years, I was English dominant. Uh, and then I became a professional Armenian. <laughs> I started doing grad school in Armenian studies, study, studying classical Armenian, Western Armenian, Eastern Armenian. And then I married an Armenian man from Armenia. So I produced Armenian children. So, uh, so my dominance, you know, has, has kind of, you know, um, changed over time. Um, you know, some people say the language you think in is your dominant language, but do you always think in the same language? A lot of us are very balanced bilinguals or unbalanced bilinguals. Like yeah. if I get angry, my language may change. If I yeah. see my kids, my mother is, is only in Armenian. Ah, yeah. Interesting. Um, so I think your dominant language, I would define it as this, is the language that you can use for 
the most domains. So think about all the domains in your life, friends, family, motherhood, job, school, church, you add on to that list and then kind of mark Armenian or English, whichever language has the most marks, I would say that's your dominant language. And that can change over time and over lots of other triggers. Right. So you learned Armenian in Armenia. Did you learn Armenian when you got here? Again, did you go to Armenian school or straight into public school? So, of course, straight into public school. My family was from Armenia. Mm -hmm. One, we didn't have the means to go to a private school, nor did my family see the need. Right. And this is a very important problem for Armenians who come from Armenia. Mm -hmm. Because diasporan Armenians come with the diasporan mentality. Mm -hmm. They know what it means to be a minority. They know what, it, what assimilation is. Armenians from Hayastan don't have this burden, the baggage. Mm. They'll understand the, the next generation. They'll exactly, yeah. exactly. But by the time they understand, it's too late. Yeah. So when they come, they come as typical immigrants. What do they want? The nice car, the house, mm. the yeah. socioeconomic success. And that's all dependent on English mm. in their mind. So for my parents, it would have been like, why would we send her to Armenian school? One, she knows Armenian, yeah. right? Two, we don't have the money. We need to make money to support her when she, she right. gets older. Um, but I came right before bilingualism became a bad thing in California. And so many new kids had come from Armenia to Glendale that um, they had created a special class for us where we had an American teacher with an Armenian oh. teacher's assistant who translated the entire curriculum That's for wow. us. And then additionally gave us Armenian lessons. So I remember writing essays for her about my mom and, you know, about oh. Armenia and all of this. And I think that was such an important validation for me because, and I've shared this before too, I remember the last book I read before we got on the flight to come to the U.S. was Jane Eyre in Armenian. And then I came here and they put me in fifth grade and they gave me Amelia Bedelia, the, you know, the picture book. And I was so insulted as a 10 yeah. year old. And Jane Eyre is awesome. I mean, that's high level reading. Uh, everything. Yeah. And I an thought Armenian it was an Armenian too. novel, mm -hmm. mind you. When, yeah. when we got it in the ninth grade, Jane I was like, Eddie on your this is not an Armenian <laughs> novel. <laughs> <laughs> hey, my mom would say, Polly, she is a lawyer. Oh, right. right. <laughs> um, so, so I think, you know, I came at the right time. The, the apartment complex we lived in in Glendale was full of new Armenian kids mm -hmm. from Armenia. I didn't really have the culture shock that many kids have because there were so many of us. We played the same games. That we, makes it easier. That's yeah. Nice. That's yeah. Nice. Um, so I'm very grateful for that year or two. But then middle school, high school, nothing formal in Armenian. Um, but then everything at home was in Armenian. See, you asked about kind of the home language. To this day, my parents are very proficient in English. But for example, when we have a non-Armenian guest, it feels so awkward to talk to my parents in English. I, mm. I almost want to like giggle like a little girl. You know, that's, that's not weird. that's not a natural language of communication. So obviously, home was entirely in Armenian, and um, my parents depended on me, especially as the oldest child, for you know helping them with their bills or you know, any kind of official bureaucratic communication. So I was kind of like the one in charge. You know, I was the, the official the translator. Yeah. yeah. So that was an interesting dynamic too. Well, what I wanted to ask was because Armenia has a different orthography, a different spelling, I was curious if you experienced it, but maybe some of your students have experienced this having a different spelling coming here and then having to learn the other spelling or vice versa. Has that proven difficult for students? Um, that's a very important question. And unfortunately, one that's become very politicized and very mm -hmm. controversial. But as someone who studies languages and loves languages, for me, it's um, I look at it a little differently. Um, we have two modern standards and we have two spelling systems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can get into why and how and, and yeah. uh, we don't have to. But, yeah. you know, for example, I, am, I, I have a subscription to The Economist, which is written in the UK. And they spell color C-O-L-O-U-R. Right. I don't throw a fit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't rip apart the magazine. Yeah. I don't right. tear out my hair. I just kind of shrug and I move on. Right. right. So for me, it's like the more the merrier. We have two beautiful standards, both equal and, and equally important to our literary and cultural wealth. And we have two spelling systems. So what, right. I, what I tell my, for example, my daughter who grew up in our home where we use 
the reformed orthography in Armenia, but she went to Shamalian and they were using classical. classical orthography. And my message to her was, how lucky are you? You get to learn both. You get to learn both. Even you go better. to Armenia, this is the way you use it. You read a diasporan work, you got this, right? That's awesome. And I think uh, this is like a, a kind of a cry to parents and to teachers. The attitude you set is the attitude yeah. the youth will follow. If you say, oof, I don't oh, understand this one. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I, well, that's the attitude you're passing along. But right. if you say, wow, how awesome. Right. And, and, and it's like a dozen rules, guys. It's a dozen rules. I feel like, yeah. I feel like nope, it's just the definitely. West. I feel like it's just the Western Armenian endangered, uh, getting extinct kind of anxiety and nervousness that perpetuates that kind of attitude. You know, do you think then Armenia, the, the Republic has a role in helping maintain Western Armenian? Can they help? I mean, how would you even do that in Armenia with, would you have all official documents then in both Western and Eastern and then have two official spellings? That wouldn't work, you know? You know, language policy and all policy has to do with vision. If you have the vision and you have the dedication and commitment to make that vision a reality, everything is possible. There are lots of multilingual states that function not in two versions of the same language, in multiple languages mm -hmm. and they produce all of their yeah. official documents. In India has probably like a hundred. Okay. Yeah. So it's an issue of vision. And I think, again, um, we can get into this or not. I think the diaspora had this long held hope and expectation that after independence, Armenia would all of a sudden turn and, you know, shift back to classical orthography and all of this. But Armenia, and I'm a product of the independence years. Mm -hmm. We were sitting uh, around a fire with no electricity and no yeah. hot water for hours. I think orthography was not, not, on, your uh, not <laughs> on top of the priority at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, again, could things have been done differently? Absolutely. But at this moment, I think kind of turning backward is, is not productive. Does Armenia have a role in maintaining Western Armenian? I think it can, but... Will it? I don't know. Nerses Kopalyan from, uh, he's another academic. Mm -hmm. he, he talks about how Armenia has this cultural capital that they can offer mm -hmm. to the diaspora. That's mm -hmm. why I look at, you no, know. No, absolutely. And I, now I look at, you know, Syrian Armenians in Armenia and, and then perhaps cur currently Lebanese Armenians who uh, might end up in Armenia if they choose to do so. If I were a policymaker, I would be popping up schools in Western Armenian. I would be... And, you know, Syrian Armenians have already shifted that dynamic and diasporan Armenians who've repatriated 10, 20 years ago. If you were a Western Armenian speaker and you went to Armenia and you spoke Western Armenian, you got funny looks or laughs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you go to Armenia and you hear Western Armenian and it's like, oh, they have the best food. <laughs> they have the best. <laughs> it's you know, becoming normalized a little exactly, bit. At least in Yerevan, exactly. But, yeah. so, which, is, which is awesome to see. Well, for us, it is. Or like, oh, for everyone. Yeah. For everyone. Yeah. I'm so happy that my friend's kids or my friends are exposed to Western Armenian and this kind of exoticization of Western Armenian is becoming normalized. My hope is, for example, in the 1940s, you know, during the big repatri repatriation campaign, mm -hmm. lots of Western Armenian speakers came to Armenia and unfortunately many of them transitioned to Eastern Armenian. I hope, I would love to see Western Armenians take on Eastern Armenian because naturally they will, but maintain Western Armenian and for Western Armenian to become part of the cultural and linguistic fabric of Armenia. Well, do you think there might be some hybrid in the future, hundreds of years from now? <laughs> hundreds possible. of years from or now? Most? I don't know. If, At this moment, I don't think so. And I don't yeah, see it, a reason for that. Not um, on purpose, yeah, but maybe no, by I, chance. I know. mean, do we have a Los Angeles Armenian? Mm, maybe, I, maybe yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's possible. But I think, and, and the other thing that's important for Armenia and important for us here, and, and this is uh, something else that I think about all the time, is the normalization of interdialectal conversations. So I speak Eastern Armenian, you speak Western Armenian. I, I assume you speak Western mm -hmm. Armenian as well. Um, I am completely comfortable speaking Eastern Armenian and expecting you to respond in Western Armenian. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you feel just as comfortable maintaining your standard and us having a wonderful conversation. And should there be a word or a phrase that I use or you use that's not familiar, all I would have to do is say, 
Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And then we continue. Then you learn. (laughs) And you learn. But what's happening, especially in the diaspora, is I'm so stressed and anxious and self-conscious about my Eastern Armenian. And you're so stressed and anxious and conscious of your Western Armenian. The easy fix is... Switch to English. Mm. I had Barska High friends who, in a you know group of Western Armenian speakers, I'd never heard him speak Armenian, and I'm like, "Hi, guy, I know you speak Armenian. Why don't you speak?" And he's like, "Oh, it's different, you know." And you've experienced that in your family, like balancing both yeah. dialects. No, yeah, we speak both dialects, uh, but it's normalized. You know, any Armenian yeah. is it goes our uh, goes well, but um, in Armenia. They know Western Armenian pretty well. Their their grandparents, like you said, knew it. They they, they would tell me all the time that we grew up hearing it. You yep. know, yeah. and my mom, um, I didn't know my mom knew Western Armenian until I had kids. And my mom started telling my kids about her grandma, and she started telling my kids like a, a, a little joke her grandma would say, and the whole joke was in Western Armenian. I was like, mom. You know, for all of 25 years, you failed to mention. Yeah. That's amazing. Entire, right? Yeah. And so I think a lot of Armenians from Armenia may not be aware that yeah. they have Western Armenian roots. Yeah. Where did you end up no, I think <laughs> coming I from? Right. No, speaking of, of that, that, speaking of that, can you, I know it's kind of a, a larger question, but can you give us maybe a brief evolutionary timeline of, of, of the Armenian language from, you know, inception to, to present day? How did it evolve? You know, very brief. <laughs> yeah, very, 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 <laughs> really, yeah, yeah. very quick question. Uh, okay, so first thing, Armenian is an Indo-European language. Um, that's important to know, just mm-hmm. like English, right? Mm-hmm. So Armenian and English come from the same ancestor, proto mm-hmm. the Proto-Indo-European language. Um, there are a lot of theories about where Indo-European languages started and where Armenian fits into that. Um, one very prominent linguist, for example, at UCLA argued that all Indo-European languages started from the Armenian Highland. That's yeah. not now the more accepted version, but doesn't matter. It's southern Ukraine, right? Or that, yeah. like, that's the barrier. Yeah. yeah. So um, the important thing to know is that Armenian kind of branched off at some point into its own very unique branch. Um, and then, you know, you, if you've gone to Armenian school, you know, and then all of a sudden we fast forward to Mestrop Manshtots and, and the alphabet. But what you have to keep in mind is that language is never static. Language is never frozen in time. So even during Mestrop's time, there were lots of variants of Armenian. So when Mestrop created the alphabet, he chose one variant to document Mm -hmm. that makes sense like we always think of like oh there was good alpash classical armenian this perfect golden that everyone shared together that everyone shared together that everyone spoke perfectly and then messed up just created the alphabet no i mean think about all the different uh, dialects we have today just within armenia there you go i'm so happy you mentioned that not even otsa imagine how much more isolated just just go from yerevan to kapan to lori yeah (laughs) And they yeah. were even more isolated back then. They didn't have phones exactly. to talk to each other. So exactly. I'm surprised they're even able to communicate with uh, between each other. Uh, maybe they weren't. <laughs> yeah, one, so one thing to keep in mind is there have, there have always been different kinds of Armenian. Mm-hmm. And the alphabet was an amazing step forward. But the, what the alphabet did is it took us from an oral culture to a written culture. And when you write something down, you freeze it in time. Mm-hmm. And you also exclude other things that didn't get written. So what we got documented was one kind of Armenian Mm -hmm. that became our literary standard language. But that doesn't mean that what people were actually speaking matched what was being recorded. So that's important to keep in mind. I always think about Latin and how the different Latin languages split off. And why don't they all spell things differently? Well, they all spelled it the same, but they pronounced the thing, the, the word differently. Right. And they split right. off into these different variations of Latin. Right. I think of it like that too with Armenian a little and, bit. Yeah. And so that's one thing. I think just general kind of linguistic science that there's always language diversity and what's recorded isn't necessarily what was Kind of, it doesn't mean that was exclusively it. There was mm-hmm. a lot that was going on. The other thing to keep in mind is kind of the history of the Armenian people, right? The Armenian statehood ended in 1375 with the fall of Kilikia, and that mm-hmm. wasn't even that was like a, a state outside of a the, the regular the, the historical, regular homeland, historical yeah. homeland. So 
Between 1375, by 1375, classical Armenian had evolved. So even the written language had evolved, right, um, to some degree. But between 1375 and 1918, there was no Armenian political state, mm. autonomous state. So there was the Armenian people who were spread across empires. So the Ottoman and the Russian and, of course, the Persian so imagine if you can imagine this kind of geographic landscape and this dispersion, even without a dispersion, there was existing language diversity and there would have been existing evolution of linguistic patterns. But now add to it this dispersion and the influence of neighboring and dominant mm -hmm. languages of these empires. No, I can't. I, I'm surprised we only have two standards, yeah, <laughs> right? Well, yeah. Tiflis and Constantinople yeah. were the centers of these. Do we know when maybe Western and Eastern Armenian? Well, you can't even say there was a Western and Eastern, right? right because it right. Was just, you can't. And yeah. and and this is another thing to keep in mind. So around the same time, in the Ottoman Empire, in Constantinople, and in the Russian Empire, a group of wealthy Armenian merchants financed a group of young wealthy or talented Armenian men to go to the most prominent universities in their area. So if that was Europe there or Russia here, mm -hmm. and they went and they learned the ideas of the enlightenment and yeah. they, they got infused with this nationalistic spirit and they came back and they said, guys, we got, <laughs> we got to communicate and enlighten the average Armenian peasant, right? Cause mm -hmm. most of the population at that time are yeah, peasants. Farmers, yeah. yeah. How do you do that by communicating with them? Well, how, can you communicate them with, with them in classical Armenian? No. Yeah. Right? That's not the language they speak. So this was an enlightenment project like the rest of the world. This is how all languages have been reformed and standard, standardized mm -hmm. and modernized. So what they did is they sat down, they picked what they considered the most prominent version. And that's, of course, complete. It's not a linguistic choice. It's a power choice. It was the urban areas. Exactly. It wasn't the yeah. Gyuratsi. Exactly. The Vulture, yeah. Exactly. But that's not to say that the Gyuratsi's language was any less proper. Oh, Do you know I mean, what I yeah, mean? It's yeah. a coincidence. Of course, yeah. yeah. So, and it's interesting that this happened kind of in the same time in the two spheres. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By this time, there was a, a well-established sense of a Western Armenia in the Ottoman Empire and an Eastern Armenia in the Russian Empire. And these two groups kind of went through this process at the same time. And they sat and they, the reason we call it a standard language is because they standardized it. Mm -hmm. They literally put rules, yeah, right? This is what's correct and this is what's not correct. And I say that because, again, it's so important to have a standard language because you need a unifying language to communicate with the widest number of people possible. Yeah. But it's also a very... Ex exclusive and excluding thing to do because then everything that's non-standard somehow becomes perceived as not good enough or yeah. less validated exactly yeah. and i say that for any Baskai who's listening for anyone who speaks the gumri dialect for anyone who speaks any version for armglish speakers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we are communicators in our own right but just because no one labeled us as standard <laughs> yeah yeah so i i just want to say that these um it's it, it was such an important process right it, and I'm, I'm i'm right now reading a book on ethnic minorities nationalism nationalism and, and linguistic rights and you know the whole project of nationalism of creating nations out of people who didn't even see themselves as nations yeah. language was a big part of that because what you wanted is create a boundary where you have people who think they're like the others, who look like the others, and most importantly, who speak like each other. Mm -hmm. um, so this was, this was a, a, a very important motion. So at this, you know, mid 19th century, these two groups standardize these two languages and start publishing um, newspapers in these two languages, start teaching it at schools, start producing literature in these two standards. Um, and and, and uh, really, that's the process. Well, it's also because uh, even today we have it, but we have a lot of loan words from other languages. And I'm sure back then it was even more. And speaking of nationalism and the politic politicization of the language, they, you know, there's a whole movement of erasing or taking those words out. And that probably even, uh, you know, excluded some the average speaker who probably, you know, utilized more loan words. So yeah, purification the, is is yeah, definitely yeah, part and yeah, parcel. Yeah, even though I, yeah, mm. even though I'm I'm much more um, of the school that says 
borrowing is natural. Yeah, it's how language functions. Like, think about food. If you wanted to identify what is Armenian cuisine, are you willing to give up all the Greek, all the Middle Eastern, all of the Mediterranean? Excellent point. I am not. I would not. And honestly, the more the merrier. I agree. We talked about throughout the podcast how Armenian culture and language included adapts based on where you are because we exist everywhere. And those borrowed words is part of how we adapt and continue to survive. You know? I mean, I love reminding people how many, like, hundreds of hundreds of words of Iranian that we borrow, Azad, and, uh, uh, give me one. Hazad. <laughs> 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 I mean, these are words that we think are like, oh, Armenian, Armenian, but yeah. these are words that we completely share with Iran or with Farsi. Most uh, of the names that you think are the super Armenian names, Dikran. like... Oh, yeah. I guess. It, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know about Tigran, but like yep. Mihran, Nerses, Argishti, all of those come f- uh, from Iranian roots. Uh, are they now used by Persians? No. But and yeah. what does it matter? Mm-hmm. If you yeah. think about English, you know, um, you mentioned the word of the day series that we do at USC. Mm-hmm. There's a reason I do the English etymology, too. Yeah. Because I want to show that English is the language. The reason English is such a flexible language, you know, people will say, right. oh, English has such a f- wide vocabulary and it's mm-hmm. so flexible is because it welcomes everything yeah. and anything. Right. It has its Germanic. It has its Latin. It's borrowed from Native American. French, it's borrowed from neighbors. Yeah. It's an all welcoming policy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so borrowing is very natural. There's this great scholar who looked at Russian immigrants from the Soviet Union in the United States and looked at their language. And, you know, and he he said, okay, these Russians came from the Soviet Union and they don't know what a mall is. Forget the word. They don't understand mall Mm -hmm. or they don't understand mortgage or a credit card or private property. So but the easiest thing to do is borrow the freaking word, right? Yeah, true. Mold. <laughs> right? Or, yeah. or Armenians coming from Soviet Armenia. I remember my husband, his first job was working at a bank. Um, he, you know, and these Armenians would come and say, deposit. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. there wasn't the word for depositing a check or all of these things. So, But, but like you're saying, Ar- Armenian or any language can adapt. I mean, should we be trying to create new Armenian words for these loan words that we are aware of I mean, we could probably come up with something right so we can um and and that's an interesting process and there are kind of linguists who are probably better equipped to answer this question mm-hmm. so there's two things that happen you can borrow the word mm-hmm. or you can create your own word but that's all you can do whether that word now becomes used is out of your hands right your average speaker will determine that um, the other day I was reading an article about, uh, what's the English word in, um, irregardless, irregardless Webster's, one of my favorite. <laughs> Webster's dictionary go to. has decided to add it to their official word bank this year. And and linguists threw a fit. Why? Because it's not a correct word. Regardless is already without regard. It's very frustrating. So adding the IR is like saying without regard, without. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Linguistically incorrect. But does the average speaker who says irregardless care? That's a huge thing. (laughs) No. (laughs) It's communicating the idea that it's trying to. That's it. That's it. So mm -hmm. words, language, these are living things. We as linguists, as community leaders, as cultural gatekeepers can provide the Armenian word. Do it. I'm all for it. If you can come up with a good Armenian equivalent, do it. But that's all you can do. Mm-hmm. Mm. That your speakers will decide if that word becomes used or not. Stopped it. And yeah. shifting gears a little bit, what are some of the best ways for non-Armenian speaking members of the diaspora, such as myself, to learn the language? I've, you know, I'm trying to learn it. I knew a little bit when I was younger. That's sort of faded away, and I'm really trying to learn it again. And obviously, learning how difficult it is. And obviously, when you ask someone. Oh, how, you know, what's the best way to learn Armenian? First thing everyone will tell you is, well, go live in Armenia for three months. Obviously, not everyone has that, you know, option, especially right. right now. What are some ways that you suggest for, you know, members of the diaspora to learn the language? But before I answer, can I ask why you want to learn? Absolutely. It's always been a huge insecurity of mine, um, just in the sense of my uh, grandfather on my father's side was a dead hide. So, you know, very Armenian spoken, didn't speak much English. So 
you know, it was just always those conversations where you're at the house, you're at the table, you know, and, you know, can't go away from the table. You can't not be at the conversation. So even if you don't know what's actually being said, it was a lot of, you know, nodding my head, laughing, not sure why I was laughing always, but a lot of this. And it was something where I may not have had the time when I was younger. I may not have even had the interest that I do now. And it's something where I've obviously seen how much more difficult it is and how much easier it would have been when I did have more people in my life where I would have been able to have those conversations with them like that. Okay. Um, A couple of things. One, Armenian is not a difficult language to learn. Let's toss that out of the equation. This notion that English is so easy to learn and Armenian is so difficult is a what I would call folk linguistics. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are some studies that show if you're coming from language A and learning language B, it'll be easier or harder. So if you're going from one Romance language to another, if you're going right. from French to Spanish, obviously that's easier than going from French to Arabic mm-hmm. or French to Russian. Th- that plays a role to some degree. Armenian is by no means one of those super hard languages right. to learn. Let's... Yeah. You know, that's kind of toss that out of the equation too. this notion that as an adult, it's impossible to learn. And if you didn't pick it up in your childhood, then it's too late. No, which is whether that is true or not is a common thought. Yes. Um, second language acquisition specialists would tell you that children have some advantages and kind of their natural propensity and the plasticity in their brain. But adults are actually better learners, yeah. right? Because they have cognitively are, that makes sense to are, me. are more developed. Mm-hmm. So this notion that I'm an adult and it's too late for me, let's also toss that out. Um, going to Armenia is a great option, but obviously, as you mentioned, not uh, uh, an accessible one for all. And also, if you want to learn Western Armenian, going to Armenia may not be the best. So... Again, uh, we started the conversation with this. The key is to expose yourself to the language and to have the courage and the kind of guts to use it. So what I would recommend for you is immerse yourself in the language. Start listening to Armenian. Start reading. Learn the alphabet. The alphabet is not hard, guys. That's actually something I still... I can do a little reading every now yeah. and then. Do I necessarily know the words? No. But right. I can read it. I can say what right. it actually says. Are you saying, like, read it without even understanding no, it? No, I think you should under... Both. Yeah. Reading is a is a skill based on automaticity, right? Mm-hmm. You need your kind of neurons to connect a graph, so image, to sound. And your it's muscle memory. So there is a kind of an... Um, uh, for fluency, for automaticity, yes, you can read and kind of don't worry about the understanding, but then you also need to develop vocabulary and grammatical skills. So I would I- immerse yourself with whatever resources you have. With the technology you have right now, you can, you know, access songs, access poetry, access conversations. You can also, you know, get on a Zoom chat and, and find someone to speak to you, right? But so it's, Input and output. The Mm -hmm. simplest thing I can tell you is get yourself as much input as possible, but more importantly, or equally as important, use it as much as you can. And do not worry about what anyone says, the looks you get, the raised eyebrows you get. Just use it. If you have to put a sticky note on everything around you with the Armenian word, do it. Because that visual memory, that association between the visual and the object, do it. If you have a couple of friends who speak, um, one final thing. Um, so um, Stephen Krashen, who's kind of the godfather of second language acquisition, um, ha- has this great formula for kind of the best way to learn a second language, which is what you need to do is you need to be exposed to someone who speaks one degree better than you. Why is that? Because you have enough competence to understand the content, content and context to be engaged, but you have that extra one degree of novelty to learn. 
Um, so if you're exposed to someone who's maybe 10, 20 degrees above you, then you don't have anything to hang on to, anything to grasp. And if you're exposed to someone who is, you know, your level minus one, minus two, you will benefit them and maybe it'll be good practice, mm-hmm. but there won't be things to add on. So if you can find someone who is patient enough and tolerant enough and engaged enough to constantly engage you in Armenian in all, and I see there's a fist bump happening here, <laughs> in all kinds of contexts, do it. I And if you need models, role models, or kind of successful adult age folks who've learned Armenian, I have many. Mm-hmm. And if that's a source of inspiration, we can do that too. By no means, don't let anything discourage you and none of this folk linguistic stuff. Mm-hmm. I think that's important to hear because it is something where I know that there are plenty of Armenians like me who don't know the language but do have that desire mm-hmm. to learn it. And there is a sense of overwhelm. Intimidating. Yeah, it's intimidating. It's something that is also so so easy for so many of your friends because they were raised learning Armenian. Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas to, it does come off as, why is this so difficult for me? Whereas, we for example, my older sister, she's three years older than me. Those three years have made all the difference in terms of uh, retention of the language. Mm-hmm. I mean... My sister, she can speak it. She can right. she, a lot more than my brother or I can. And part of that is we were younger. We didn't have as many years in Armenian school. But it's definitely, there has always been an intimidation factor of learning Ar- with learning Armenian. Um, and that, uh, that I think it's also important to acknowledge that, you know, um, I hear people say, I don't understand these Armenian youth. They pick up all these other languages, and then when it comes to Armenian, they struggle. What is this? They can learn Spanish, they can learn French, but then when it comes to Armenian, they can't do it. And my answer to that is, when they're learning Spanish or French or Japanese or Mandarin, no one expects them to be the ideal Frenchman or the Spaniard Mm, or the Japanese. That's an excellent point. So they are not performing an identity with those languages. That is not their essence or their perceived essence. It's just the language they're using. And when they fumble, no one says, shame on you. The whole OSG, all of a sudden, you've just, you know, embarrassed the whole OSG. No, people laugh and they say it's a foreign language. Bravo. Quite the opposite. When we have non-Armenian students in our Armenian classes, we roll out the red carpet for them. Thank you so much. We're so tickled. You've decided mm-hmm. to learn our language. But mm-hmm. then when the Armenian student comes who doesn't know the language, we wag the finger and we say, how dare you? How could you have not learned it? So I think the onus is on us as community members to support speakers and learners like you instead of kind of giving you the odd look, but to say, what because do you need I've, from I've us? I've had both of those interactions. I've had interactions where people have been very encouraging. There, there was one time where I, an Uber driver was very disappointed in me for my mm-hmm. lack of Armenian language knowledge. Mm-hmm. And it became a thing where, it's, well, my my children don't eat in the morning if they don't speak in Armenian. And it was this, I can feel, you know, a genuine, like, he was disappointed to meet an Armenian who didn't know the language and who had, you know, my name's Armin, it's an mm-hmm. Armenian name. And Pretty it was, much. right, it's... it's Kind of. <laughs> but that's part of it. Like, what you're saying is, I don't feel this pressure to speak Spanish in a way where mm-hmm. I should sound right. Whereas with Armenian, it's like, I am Armenian. I, I look, Ar- my name's Armin. Like, Which creates this whole other level of pressure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. This this way of, but I should know this, is, this should be part of my identity. <laughs> so, because the community views you as a member of this community and the template for that member is one that speaks Armenian. Exactly. Whereas when you are learning Spanish or French, by no means do you have to perform membership. Right. And I think some of that does come from being in the diaspora. There's a sense of delicacy, Mm -hmm. urgency, Mm -hmm. you know, with with, um, trying to carry the language along with carrying our culture. Everything. Everywhere we go. A lot of responsibility. No pressure. We got it. (laughs) I did want to take it back a sec. You did mention technology. Uh, Back in the day when there's diasporas, maybe in the 16th, 17th century, they, you know, aren't around anymore because maybe there wasn't enough speakers in the area. But are you optimistic that technology might help prolong the diasporas 
uh, going forward because I'm thinking you can raise your children with all Armenian YouTube, all Armenian TV, all Armenian this and that, and Skyping, whatever Armenian. And um, and I've also noticed you use technology in your Armenian teaching. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're using that medium? Um, yes, um, I am very excited about technology, but there is a but mm -hmm. um, with some caution. And, and I'll, I'll explain why. I think technology has erased a lot of boundaries and limitations, physical boundaries, uh, importantly, right? So you no longer have the geographic limitations of being in a particular space to access it or accessing speakers and all of this. Um, and in that sense, technology is amazing. Technology has also provided tools for learning uh, that we wouldn't have had otherwise. But language learning... And, and, you know, I think your question was diaspora in general, but I'm going to bring it back to language. Language learning is a relational thing. It's based on relationships and interactions. Mm -hmm. So, and I want to go back to, I'm so happy you said the word tool at the beginning of this conversation. Language at the end of the day is a tool. And this Armin goes back to you. You have to figure out a way for Armenian to be a tool for you to accomplish something else that pleases you. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't be learning Armenian just to learn Armenian. I mean, yes, of course you're doing that, but Armenian should be a tool that um, giving you access to something that gives you joy, something that brings you happiness, yeah. something that stimulates something you, useful and something yeah. useful. So, um, and as, as children, we acquire language to meet our basic needs, whether that's the need for food, that's the need for entertainment, for company, for love. So an iPad can't replace that. An iPad can't be your grandma's lap. Um, and I think one thing I worry about is like Armenian parents almost outsourcing language learning to technology. You know, it's first they tried teachers or schools and now it's like, Okay, we'll download this app. Or yeah. um, So you can hire a teacher over Zoom right now from Armenia or from the Middle East to talk to your kid. But it won't be the same, right? Um, yeah. That's true. So I think technology is a useful tool, like language, but it's not the answer to every problem. You can't yeah. just throw technology at every problem. Mm. I agree. My brother's trying to learn German on Zoom right now at his public school, mm. and he hasn't <laughs> learned anything because I'm like, how are you supposed to learn a right? This brand and new part of it is, like, that? like you said, part of it is that immersion. I remember when I was taking Spanish class, um, half of the class period was always okay. Now with three people, have a conversation about what you did yesterday, mm -hmm. and that's and that was the most for me personally mm -hmm. the constructive part of yeah, the class. Best practice, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, absolutely, absolutely. So, again, I think if you have the right vision. And if you have a problem and technology can be a useful tool to solve that problem, yes. But if you have a problem, you don't have a vision for the answer and, and you throw technology at it, I don't think that's a good use of technology. Okay. In terms of what I'm doing um, at the Institute of Armenian Studies at USC, um, so it all started very kind of haphazardly. I joined the team at USC from UCLA um, and we have a bunch of student workers who are USC students who, you know, um, work at our office. And, and they all found out that I'm, you know, I, I used to teach Armenian at UCLA, that I'm interested in language and linguistics. And at least once a day, someone can knock on my office and like, hey, Shushan, mm -hmm. how would you say this in Armenian? Or what's the etymology of this word? So I started doing it just for our student workers. I would just you know, mm -hmm. grab a marker. We have a little whiteboard. And I started doing it. And one day, one of them filmed it because I was like, I want to, um, she said, I want to show my mom or I want to show my friend because... They always ask me about this. And all of a sudden, a couple of days later, we had a word of the day program. It became a series and I watch it. With yeah, yeah, it's awesome. It I became it. a series um, and it's kind of taken on a life of its own where I used to kind of do that for my own personal social network, right? I always have friends, family, former students from UCLA who will text me or email me, Shushan, I'm in an argument with my mom or my mother-in-law, or help. Yeah. <laughs> so now it's kind of become this like diaspora, global, Armenian nationwide project where people will post on our Instagram page or they'll email me and say, hey, can you do this on Word of the Day? Or, hey, I made a bet with my friend. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, could you give us a Word of the Day for today, Shushan? For August 20, oh, 27th. I was thinking of such a good one the other day. Okay, hold on. Maybe we can continue talking as I It'll think of it. To what degree 
is language attributed to the preservation or strength of one's identity or self-perception mm-hmm. as it relates to their culture. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to pick at the word preservation and then I'll answer your question. Right. Let's hear it. Because I feel like I'm a broken tape recorder, but I'm going to say it and I don't care if you've heard this, me say this elsewhere. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, when you say preservation, you immediately imply that something is dead. Correct. When we talk about preserving Armenian culture or preserving Armenian language, the first image you get is like canned food, right? Those are preserves. Mm-hmm. It, um, it, you're, you're preserving it. Either it's dead and you're preserving it like a relic from the yeah. past or you're preserving it so it doesn't die. You're putting it in the basement. Exactly. And you're putting it in a jar to hold it in this sh- form that it's never going to change. Yeah. It's going to stay in that same form. So whether you're talking about culture or language, I really constantly urge our youth to shift the conversation from preservation to cultivation. Mm -hmm. But also, when you preserve, you have no ownership. It's someone else's thing you're preserving. But when you cultivate, you are actually part of that process of change. You are investing in that language and in that culture. And you feel that ownership and then more responsibility. Yes, for you're it. the one and in then, control. Yeah. And it's and that responsibility is different. It's the responsibility yeah. of an owner, not a renter. Yeah. It, it, it's also not the responsibility being told to us. Yes. To be respons- it's, yes. It's ourselves. Yes. Yeah. And, and so much of the talk about Armenian preservation is like the moral burden the duty mm-hmm. the baggage and it, you know I, and sometimes i think I, you're right i think there is a negative connotation that comes with yes the word preservation. even though you know the post-genocide generation man that they have things to deal with and the preservationist ideology worked it worked like a charm we in the middle east we created an armenian speaking diaspora from a turkish speaking mm-hmm. base yeah and they did it so is it possible to do it? Of course it's possible to do it. But again, I think that the kind of the perspective we use is really important. Now, how important is language to identity? It depends. It's Is it an enriching factor? Yes. Is it an essential factor? Yes and no. For some people, yes. For some people, no. Can you be Armenian without knowing mm-hmm. Armenian? Course, Absolutely, yes. Who am I to tell you you can't? Who mm-hmm. am I to tell you? Identity... And the, the kind of discourse around identity has shifted. Identity has gone from this predetermined, inherited thing to a, a matter of choice and negotiation, mm-hmm. right? Who am I to tell you how to choose and negotiate your identity? I personally, as a speaker of Armenian, I find that element essential to my identity and extremely enriching and something worthwhile to to transmit to my kids. But I don't think that means that that's the case for every Armenian. Mm -hmm. Um, So in terms of identity, again, I think it's enriching and not essential. And and I would not allow myself to determine what comprises an element of someone's individual identity. Now, when you talk about culture, kind of this general notion of Armenian culture, for that, I do think language is important. It's hard for me to tease apart language and culture. It's hard for me to imagine a culture devoid of its language. Mm-hmm. So I think if we're speaking on a larger scale about the kind of global Armenian experience, I think language is essential for the cultivation of Armenian culture moving forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Um, so... In, in in that sense, I think that's how uh, how I would answer that question. But I think um, it's important to see. It's important for me for the diasporan youth to see themselves as cultivators of our language, as cultivators of our culture, instead of as simply agents that transmit without any input on what gets transmitted, whether that's the language or the culture. Absolutely. I second that. <laughs> I wanted to ask, actually ask this earlier. Maybe we can even snip it in there. But uh, I wanted to hear an example of an Armenian word throughout the years from Karapar to Middle Armenian to mm. Modern Armenian. Do you have a word like that? And maybe that could be your word of the day. Yeah, I think, you know, this is interesting because I was telling my friends that um, 
we should do a podcast episode. So I have two really good friends that I went to grad school uh, with, and we uh, took classical Armenian together. And we will all we were all heritage speakers of Armenian. So I was an Eastern speaker, and the two of them were Western speakers, and we took it out Pash together. Um, and we thought, well, sure, we know Armenian. Good out pot, piece of cake, <laughs> right? Uh, not the case. Yeah, no, I took a uh, class and I like only one class and yeah. I cut out because I was like, I can't do it. Um, definitely not the case. And um, so I, I suggested that for our podcast at USC that we invite our good out pot professor and the three of us and talk about what it feels like as a heritage speaker to study. Uh, classical Armenian. So it's like an English speaker studying Latin, right? Or a French speaker right. studying Latin. Um, I think a lot of words, I don't know if I can think of one word, but uh, like simple words like body, mm-hmm. right? Or potty in Western Armenian. Yeah. So what does that mean in contemporary Armenian? A good, good hap- nice, yeah, nice. Good. Yeah, or like kind, especially kind. in Eastern Armenian, it has a very right. specific, you know, kind. But um, in classical Armenian, the kind of the semantic range is very different of certain words. So you wouldn't use it in, in the sense of kind. You would definitely use it more in the sense of good, mm-hmm. right? So um, I think um, some words, the word hasn't changed, but its meaning, the range of, it, of its meaning has evolved. Um I'm trying to think of uh, maybe other interesting. Uh, also, the grammatical elements are really funny. You can have like very quirky things happen. So, for example, Haj, mm-hmm. father, mm-hmm. modern Armenian, and the plural in modern Armenian would be Hajj, right? Um, the it. In classical Armenian, you would mark the plural with a k. So think about, for example, zeren, zeren. So hand, hand, zerk in classical Armenian meant two hands mm. but in modern armenian it's become one hand ah. same thing voten one leg voten one leg votk two legs mm. aken one nut achk one eye mm. aken two eyes achk oh two ah. eyes together so the plural in classical armenian has become the singular in modern Armenian. Right. And we've added kind of an, an additional a, modern plural, Armenian. Right. But so, Haj in classical Armenian was one father, Hajk, fathers, and then the accusative, which would be your direct object. So, I love our fathers, would be Hars. So, mm. in, if you've, I don't know if you remember this from your classical Armenian class, K is the kind of nominative plural marker, and S is the accusative, which is the direct object. So every time we would come across the word hoss, what would we translate it as? Bride. No, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? And our professor was like, no. but how could it be bride? It no. makes no sense in this context. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get to that. No. So there's all it. these like really cool quirks of, you know, things that have come around and, and, and the way words have evolved and, and grammar has evolved. I honestly, by the way, Armen, going back to your question, I know this sounds very counterintuitive. I would highly recommend also studying classical Armenian. It, it might seem strange to say for someone who wants to learn modern Armenian, study classical Armenian, but man, do you have a sense of how we got here? How we got here and just how close Eastern and Western Armenian oh, yeah. are. I mean, you could say that why they teach Latin to a lot of people. Yes, kids is, absolutely. You know, it, absolutely. Latin, middle ground. Your base is going to be. You took Latin? <laughs> Four okay. years of Latin. <laughs> you should take classical Armenian. <laughs> then, yeah. Maybe I and should. then modern Armenian will be a piece of cake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know we've done this word um, on word of the day, but I think this is uh, kind of very appropriate for the context. Um, so the word ungej. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have watched that that word of the day episode. I have, but you know? I like that you I'm picked that, that one. one. Okay, let's yeah. hear it. Um, so, uh, well, okay, and get in in uh, in English we would say friend, but you could also say companion, mm-hmm. right? And you've mm-hmm. studied Latin. Okay, so co is you know shared partnership, whatever, yeah. and then pan for anyone who's studied French or Latin is what bread bread. Right, so someone you share bread with. Mm-hmm. So unged, one theory for the etymology is it comes from unt get unt as in with mm-hmm. get as in mm-hmm. Yeah, someone you share bread with, someone you eat with. I love right, that. that's and you literal know, translation isn't it of funny breaking that, bread. Yeah. That everything goes back to food. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at, at the core of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so too. It makes sense. Um, it goes back to food, but oh, now I'm kind of reminiscing about the classical Armenian days. I honestly can't recommend enough 
exploring classical army. And this is something I would say both in Armenia and in Armenian schools here, which be, by the way, cool. traditionally yeah. Armenian schools in the diaspora had a kind of a line of studying classical Armenian. I, I'm, it's such a shame we've lost that. I think, you know, this makes me think about um, something I worry about, which is I think we don't give enough credit to our youth. It seems as if our institutions are assuming are assuming that because they haven't succeeded, it's it's because the youth isn't up for it, or the youth isn't interested, or the youth isn't doesn't have the capacity. But I almost feel like it's the other way around. Yeah, they don't know it, so they're like, oh, why? not not no, not that they don't know it. It's that they. Mm, Maybe they haven't challenged the youth in the right way. Maybe mm. they haven't given them the right content. You know what I mean? Why not teach mm. classical Armenian? Or empower them to realize that they can. Exactly, exactly. So sometimes I think, you know, in Armenian, we have this phrase like to mm-hmm. treat someone like a person, like, an, like a, someone important. I think maybe I, I'm all for, you know, kind of the cup is half full instead of half empty. I love the student who comes who's not that kind of, goody two shoes you know Mm -hmm. the one who is a challenge because then that's that's kind of a creative problem to deal with Mm -hmm. i think i don't know i think we should have a more positive outlook and i think we should sometimes when you challenge the youth they surprise you and they kind of meet the challenge um the more i like i have learned about karapar the more magical armenian has even seemed every letter has a meaning and that's why it's there correct me if i'm wrong if the z begins at a word it has something to do with maybe feeling uh, or something like that. Well, the Z in classical Armenian, it marks the direct object, right? So, it's, like, it, it, and Western Armenian has carried that over. Right. So, Zis, right? You mm-hmm. use it when it's the direct well, My grandmother's object. name is Zavart, so it's like the feeling. Right, uh, r- right. right. The, yeah, and, and or like the use of um, the alphabet for numbers. That's also yeah, that's you know, so a lot cool. of people. And, you know, I'm wearing a watch from Armenia that has the alphabet yeah, as, as the numbers. So, yeah. Um, it, it's cooler it's than it's a treasure trove that'll have yeah. no end. Definitely, there's certainly magic in the language and in all languages at every stage. Um, thank you so much, Sushan, for joining us today and for this deep dive into Armenian language. I had so much fun. So much fun. Mm-hmm. I could I could this talk about really this good. forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you, guys. It was just as pleasant and enjoyable for me. <laughs> thank you. Come back anytime, please. You're listening to High Tuk Talks, the official podcast of the AYF West. I'm Krista Marina Apardian. And I'm Haik Minasyan. And we're just a couple of Armenians. Talking in the world. A couple of Armenians talking in the world. Go ahead. Try to destroy them.